were dynamic. Jimmy Johnson's taking his team from the absolute worst to the absolute best. They were dominating. Ten, five, touchdown. They were a dynasty. This is the Cowboys' third victory in four Super Bowls. This is the Cowboys' Super Reunion on CBS 11. The 2017 season will mark the silver anniversary of the Cowboys Super Bowl 27 victory. Hello, I'm Bill Jones and welcome to the Cowboys Super Reunion to celebrate the 25th anniversary of the team that started a dynasty. Joy Aikman put together a reunion. It was much more than just a gathering. Aikman used it as an opportunity to raise funds for the United Way of Metropolitan Dallas. When their quarterback called, the 92 Cowboys responded, including former Cowboys head coach Jimmy Johnson, who made a rare return to Dallas since his departure in 1994. The event proved to be a success and was the perfect way for Aikman to jumpstart his tenure as the campaign chair for the United Way. In an atmosphere similar to a high school reunion, old teammates gathered at Gillies in Dallas from the moment the players and coaches arrived and stepped on the blue carpet, 25 years melted away. Well, it's great to see the guys, you know, all the coaches and the players. Hey, a lot of them I haven't seen since uh, like 92 or 93, so some of them look different. <laughs> I'm sure I do too. I think Jimmy looks the same way he did when I met him as a 17-year-old when we were <laughs> freshmen at the University of Arkansas. It is very special. 20-some-odd uh, years ago, and a whole lot more darker hair than this, a lot more hair than this, we did some amazing things. We just played because we just love balling. Uh, competition, uh, getting these young bucks like uh, Woodson here, teaching them how to play the game, passing on the legacy, and uh, it, was, it was really fun for us. The latest member of the Cowboys Ring of Honor, Darren, what, what blows your mind when you see tonight's turnout? Walking in and seeing guys like this. You know, <laughs> when I came in the league as a rookie, he was right. I was, I was wet behind the ears, and he beat me up a little bit. James Washington beat me up. They got me in the right spot, and, you know, my career took off. But it's, it's about learning from the best, and this is where I learned from. You know, that's what's great about these types of events. Uh, when you haven't seen someone in a long time, and, and you really, I think, find out what the friendship's all about when you can just step in and it feels like you've just seen each other yesterday. This is so great. I mean, I, it's, it's great. It was so many people out here. And, oh, my. Oh, look at Coach, Coach yeah. Switzer. It's, it's like, oh, man, he just sneaks in. He just sneaks in. Yeah. Oh, yeah, but it went. It's so great. The reunion hit the big stage once the event moved into the main ballroom. What better way to set the mood for the evening than a reminder of the Cowboys championship season. Highlights and memories of the team's road to the Super Bowl 27 victory. Welcome back 
to Dallas, the head coach of the 92 Cowboys, Jimmy Johnson. In addition to Jimmy Johnson, a parade of players and coaches from the 92 team were introduced. Michael and it was only fitting that it was the Super Bowl 27 most valuable player himself who assumed the role of student body president. And welcome back to Dallas, the Cowboys class of 1992, one of the best in franchise history. I want to welcome everybody here tonight and say thank you uh, for coming. It's going to be a great night. I don't know how it can't be. We've got the great Jimmy Johnson in from the Florida Keys. He rarely leaves the Keys this time of year, so the fact that he here is here means a lot. We've got Mark Stepnoski, who uh, got out of the wilderness in Western Canada to, to be here tonight. You know, Step, there's a few things that we've got to catch you up on. You know, uh, cell phones, <laughs> internet, and the fact that Nate Newton now weighs just 210 pounds. And I don't think you're much bigger than that yourself, right? And I'm wondering what the hell happened to this great wall of Dallas, you know? And whatever diet plan that you guys are on, I don't think Hellestray's on that same plan. I mean, hey, he might be, he might be, but I don't think he is. All right, we'll check with them later. Hey, so this event uh, really kind of began a couple years ago. And I was having dinner with a few former teammates, Daryl Johnston and Gizek and Chad Hennings and Novacek, and we, we got to talking and what happens in these conversations. You say, hey, I wonder what so-and-so's doing, or I wonder what this guy's now doing. And, and so that was really the start. And we said, you know, we ought to get everybody together. And as we kind of moved through the last year and a half or so, uh, it kept coming up that these teams were so special and, and the guys and the relationships meant so much that we needed to do something. So I went to Jennifer Sampson, the CEO of the United Way, and said, hey, how can we do a reunion and at the same time do something really impactful for United Way and for the city of Dallas? And I wasn't real sure how we would do that. But for those of you that know Jennifer Sampson, you can imagine uh, how quickly she jumped on it and then took what was going to be a real intimate setting and morphed it into <clears throat> what we have here tonight. <clears throat> so I'm really excited about it. <clears throat> I, I would like to re recognize Jennifer Sampson and her team that really, I mean, when you look at this, anyone who's put on an event knows that these things just don't happen. So uh, Jennifer Sampson, Kit Sars, Amanda Whitelaw, and Tony Fay. Yeah, give them a round of hand. And, um, and there's so many others. I mean, there's, there's volunteers all throughout this room, and, and uh, thank you to all of them. The last thing I want to say is, for those of us that played for Jimmy Johnson, uh, he would give a speech about being the best. And if you were with the Cowboys for any length of time, you heard this speech probably a dozen times. And the premise of the speech is built around one simple question. How many people in their life at some point can say that they were the best? In whatever, in whatever you want to choose, how many people can say that at some point in their life they were the best? whether that's the best CEO, whether that's the best stage manager, whether that's the best attorney, dentist, doctor, whatever it may be. And it's not just related to professions. You know, Jimmy would say, hey, what about being the best husband? What about being the best brother, the best father, the best mother? Uh, and when you think about it, there's not many people that can say that because they don't have an opportunity to really be put on a platform where you can truly measure yourself and say that you were the best. There's a lot of people in this room that were the best. And I'm not just talking about the players and the coaches and the people in the organization on those three teams. But I also know that those people that were on those three teams, for those moments in time, we were the best. And that's a great feeling. And in a lot of ways, that's why we're here tonight, to celebrate those achievements. But as I've said all week long, 
The achievements were great. The rings are awesome. The Lombardi Trophy that Jerry Jones gave each and every one of us is significant. And we all proudly display those things at our houses. And when you walk by it, it's another remembrance of, of really a, a great accomplishment. But I really believe the reason everyone is here is because of the relationships and the friendships that were forged during those years. And that's the part of it that will last the rest of our lives. And we walk through the blue carpet today. I'm seeing people that I haven't seen in 15 years. And as soon as you see them, you give them a hug and it feels like you just saw them yesterday. And that's what sports is all about. So we're going to have a great night tonight. We're going to celebrate that. We're going to celebrate accomplishment. We're going to celebrate friendship. And uh, I'm honored. I truly am honored. I'm humbled, to be quite honest with you, that you're here. And I thank you from the bottom of my heart. Have a good night. Still ahead, Troy Aikman tells us how he almost became owner of the team he beat in Super Bowl 27. Plus, Jimmy Johnson steps into the spotlight as the two-time Super Bowl head coach explains how he built a dynasty in Dallas when the Cowboys' Super Reunion continues. This is the Cowboys' Super Reunion on CBS 11. The 1992 Cowboys earned the Super Bowl, third Super Bowl win in Cowboys history and the first for the Jerry Jones, Jimmy Johnson regime. Both the head coach and owner took a great deal of pride in designing the bling that went into the Super Bowl ring. Uh, when they talked about the star-shaped diamond, I said, well, give us the star-shaped diamond and cram in as many other diamonds as you can cram in. We certainly feel like that we are the best, and uh, we wanted to have the best ring that's ever been designed, and uh, we wanted it to basically simply state Dallas Cowboys World Champions, and I think we got there with this ring. You take it off. <laughs> Uh, I take it off when I uh, sleep and swim. <laughs> <laughs> now, the key to the reunion was convincing Jimmy Johnson to leave his home in the Florida Keys. As he was prone to do as a player, Troy Aikman got the job done. With Jimmy on board, one of the highlights of the night was a roundtable discussion with Johnson and several of his former assistant coaches. The Q&A was moderated by the voice of the Cowboys, Brad Sham, and started with the beginning of Jimmy's tenure with the Cowboys in 1989, a year the team finished 1-15. in 15. How important was it to you to have the staff that you wanted to have around you? Well, when we first came here, uh, obviously, um, it was in desperate times. Um, you know, number one, you know, I have tremendous respect for Tom Landry, one of the greatest coaches of all time. And, um, but we knew that we had to make some changes because, I mean, they were Last in the league, they had only won three games, and we said, what can we do differently? And, you know, we had our crew coming from the University of Miami, so we thought we were pretty good, and we talked about this earlier on. You know, we had a preseason scrimmage before the preseason games, and we won that preseason scrimmage, and you would have thought we won the Super Bowl. So we thought we were going to make a big improvement, you know, with this team. Well, we went from their three wins to our one win. So we didn't improve a whole lot. But the thing that we knew we had to do, you know, with this coaching staff and with the scouts, is we had to improve the talent. And thanks to Jerry Jones, uh, with his passion, with his work ethic, with his drive to be successful, he said, hey, we'll do whatever it takes to win. And so we said, well, if it's the way the NFL does it, you know, back then they didn't trade. There was no fantasy football. And, and so... It wasn't. And, you know, we said, well, we, we've got to do something. And, and Jerry and I talked about it. We said, we've got to do something to jumpstart this thing. And we said, well, we got, you know, we're, let's make some trades. And so in that five-year period, we made 51 trades. That was more than the rest of the league put together. And so that way we were able to bring in more talent. And we were so fortunate. I mean, it was such a special time because by taking that approach, we gathered some of the most talented players in the entire league and in 
in the entire NFL history. Yeah. And it was a special time. Now, as far as these coaches, hey, they're the best. And we ended up having... That would be an applause line right there. Yeah, that's a good place. We ended up, and, and I think sometimes, you know, sometimes when you're at rock bottom, I mean, it gives you the drive, you know, to get better. You know, Jerry, when you went Shakey's Pizza or something, whatever, <laughs> you know the story. Sometimes, you know, when you're struggling, it, it gives you the drive to do a little bit extra. And that's what these guys did. Hey. We ended up having a special, special group, a special great owner, a special coaching staff, and some great, great football players. And you know what? All of us, everybody, were totally committed to be the best. And, and it went from there. But one of my most vivid memories of the 1989 season was before the first preseason game at Texas Stadium. First preseason game, and, and I was walking out past the locker room, and Dave Wanstead is pacing <laughs> up and down the ramp and, and up and down the driveway where the bus is parked, and he was like an expectant father from a 1950s sitcom, and he is smoking like a chimney. <laughs> and I said, Dave, are you okay? And he said, yeah, it's this game, you know, I'm really wound up about this guy. I said, Dave, you, you do know it doesn't count, right? <laughs> and Dave bristled up. And Dave said, are the lights on? Are they keeping score? Then it damn well counts. So, and I also Did, did remember, we win the Super Bowl that year? No, <laughs> no, not that year. If I'm not mistaken, that was the same year you played Denver in preseason. And right. Dan Reeves was still mad about how everything happened right. here. Right. And he brought John Elway back in the game in yes. the fourth quarter of a preseason game. We remember it well. Okay. Yes. So I would like those of you who were here, you four who were here in 89, and since I called you out, well, you was, start. Hey, Talk hey, about what you remember well, about all that. Two, two thoughts. That was the same year Buddy Ryan came out and said, hey, Jimmy Johnson better understand there's no East Carolinas, no offense, Vincent Smith, <laughs> no East Carolinas in the NFL. And Tony Wise in the staff room, Jimmy was pissed. And Tony <laughs> says, coach, uh, there are East Carolinas. We're the East Carolina. <laughs> I don't have a lot of stories about 89 because I was numb that entire year. <laughs> Do you remember what you felt like oh after the game God. on Thanksgiving? Jimmy came out, we had to talk oh. about doing his coach's show, and he came out, and I promise he looked like a close relative had passed away. Hey. And I We were in shock in 89. <laughs> I wasn't sure you were coming hey. back after the oh, break. We, we did win one game. You did. Yeah. We beat Washington. All right, and so that was a big win for us. Big win. And so we still had excitement. And so we're playing Arizona. And so, hey, we're winning the ball game. It's like our 10th or 11th ball game, something like that. And so I'm there, I still got that fire. I was ready for it, you know. We're about to kick their ass, you know. And at the end of the game, they had some quarterback, Tom whatever, threw a touchdown pass right over Everson Walls. And Everson Walls was such a great player. He may be here tonight. But he went right over Everson to their receiver for the touchdown. And we lost. And I'm walking off the field, and I was so used to college. In college, all the college players, you know, they'd go into the locker room, and then the, you know, the coaches would talk to them. Well, in Pro Bowl, I wasn't used to this Pro Bowl stuff. You know, a lot of the players, Charles, Haley, you, you know this. I, I like for you to go in the locker room immediately after the game. We had a little incident in Minnesota. But anyway... The players, you go one thing or another, and I walk by, and as these players will tell you, I'm a lot mellower now than what I was back then. I walk by Everson, and Everson's with that receiver that had caught the touchdown pass. <laughs> I said, 
what in the hell is going on here? And he looked at me and said, Coach, we've only won one game. We're not going to go to the playoffs. <laughs> well, as I said, I'm a lot mellower now than what I was back then, and I can't tell you what I said, but uh, I mean, we had to change something, Brad. And uh, because of these guys and because of these players, it changed and it was something special. Not only special for the Dallas Cowboys, but special for the NFL. No question. <laughs> Jimmy's just getting warmed up. Coming up, we've got more from the former Cowboys head coach, including the key acquisition that propelled the Cowboys into a Super Bowl dynasty. This is the Cowboys Super Reunion on CBS 11. Troy Eggman's association with the United Way started during his playing days with the Cowboys. Now he cements the relationship by becoming the organization's campaign chair, a role that has been held by some of the prominent and influential members of the Dallas business community. Former chairs include AT&T chairman and CEO Randall Stevenson and Rich Templeton, the chairman and CEO of Texas Instruments. CBS 11's Doug Dunbar had a chance to talk to Eggman about his decision to take over the role. Why this, why now for you? You know, maybe right now I just turned 50. Uh, I'm refocusing some of the things that I'm doing philanthropically. I was doing uh, uh, children's playrooms in children's hospitals around the country. And now I'm directing everything really more just to North Texas and, and, and really trying to put a bigger footprint uh, in North Texas with the things that I'm doing, doing through charity. And I thought this was probably the next, next logical step for me to do it. This is a guy whose commitment goes so far beyond just oh, yeah. face and just name. I mean, he's a quarterback. He thinks like a quarterback. He wants to win. And in order to win, you've got to have a strategy, and you've got to have the right people on your team, and you've got to set goals. He invests his time in helping us set those goals. He you know, makes asks when we need him to make asks. He opens doors. You know, He provides that platform that connects us to people in ways that we've never been able to before. You know, he is committed to this. So it kind of begs the question, because uh, some of the people who've uh, held the position before have ended up front office NFL. Questions out there sometimes for you as well. Is this partly a path to something like that? Do we see um, Aikman in a front office? Well, somewhere? I don't view it so much as a path. I would have an interest in, in going that route. Uh, I think there's some steps that would have to be taken in order to be prepared and do the best job you can. I don't think you just go right from broadcasting right into running a football team, although John Lynch is doing that right now in San Francisco, and a couple of others have. But I, you know, the big question is whether or not an opportunity like that would ever present itself. What about ownership? Um, I, I've been involved with a group that's, uh, that's made some bids on a couple teams. We came in second, as a matter of fact, to the Buffalo Bills. Um, so that certainly is an option. So your business side's pretty well documented. What you're about to do for United Way, uh, what are some of maybe the losses along the way that you've had that have helped, I guess, give you more fortitude or you learned a lesson along the way that maybe we didn't see from the outside? There have been ventures that haven't gone so well. And, and what I took away from that, uh, when you really sit back and you evaluate, okay, how come this one didn't work out? And it, more times than not, wasn't because it wasn't a good idea or it wasn't a good product or it, it was the people. And so I really have learned to bet on people. And, and it's not unlike my playing career. It, you know, if you have good people around you, you have a chance to have success. And in broadcasting, I've got good people around me and I have a chance to have success. And so uh, as I move into this, the, 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 the lesson that I learned is that uh, you better have a good team. And we have that here with United Way Metropolitan Dallas. It starts with Jennifer Sampson. Dallas is a very generous uh, place to live. And there are lots of people that are on the United Way Metropolitan Dallas team. It's a team sport. And having Troy as our quarterback in this next year is you know, going to allow us to do things that we've never done before, to reach audiences that we've never reached, people who've probably never heard about United Way of Metropolitan Dallas. But I think when you're rallying around something like United Way Metropolitan Dallas, it has so many great programs and the impact is measurable and it's so well run that I think people really rally behind that. I certainly have. 
Eggman will officially begin his chairmanship of the United Way fundraising campaign on July 1st, but the success of the reunion has already provided him a great head start. You know, one of the most poignant moments of the night occurred when members of the country band Prophets and Outlaws took the stage and performed My Heroes Have Always Been Cowboys, a tribute to the members of the Cowboys Super Bowl teams of the 90s who have passed away. you hold on to nothing too long just take what you need from the ladies and leave them with the words of a sad country song my heroes have always been cowboys and they still are it seems Sadly in search of And one stepping back of themselves In their slow-moving dream My heroes have always been cowboys And they still are, it seems Sadly in search of one stepping back of themselves in the slow-moving dreams. Sadly in search of, and one stepping back of themselves in the slow-moving dreams. The Super Reunion Roundtable with Jimmy Johnson and his coaching staff was scheduled to last about 15 minutes. Thankfully, it went much longer than that. As the conversation continues, Jimmy and the coaches talk about what it took to turn the Cowboys into champions. Every year we were able to add pieces to the puzzle, whether or not it be you know, special teams guys like Kenny Gant and Vanderbeek, or was the defensive guys are bringing in Charles, you know, you know, I mean, every year. But one of the big keys, and I talked to Troy about this after the first year, and the second year is bringing in somebody that was going to get close to him to bring out his ability. And after our first year, second year, after our second year, I remember going out on the practice field and I felt so bad. We were seven and nine. Troy had hurt his shoulder and all this stuff, and he didn't make the Pro Bowl. And I said, Troy, I, I, I'm sorry. I apologize because I wanted to get you in the Pro Bowl. He said, Coach, I mean, this is the type of player he was. He said, Coach, don't worry about me in Pro Bowls. I'll have plenty of time to get in a Pro Bowl. He said, I know that you're going to surround us with better players every single year. And he said, hey, thanks for bringing North Turner in. Because well, that's, that was a big piece of the puzzle. I'm right glad there. you brought that up because that was exactly where I was going to wrap this, wrap up our segment. Because you can make the argument that the most significant thing that happened off the field after 89 was when Norv Turner came in and, and became the offensive coordinator. And Norv and Robert joined the team that year. So let's just hear from you two guys a little bit about what you came into and what it became in very short order. It was clear to me this place was different. And, uh, you know, obviously the, it starts with the ownership with Jerry and, and the commitment and the things. And, and uh, you know, I love John Robinson. And he's my mentor. But, but it was clear to me Jimmy was the best coach I'd ever been around. And, 
it was very, very obvious. So that opportunity, that being here, and then he made a point uh, when I got here to spend a lot of time with me, and, and not in meeting rooms. We would, we would have Sunday fun days and right. go have a few margaritas, and Jimmy does like Mexican food. I don't know if any of you knew that, but, and he got to know me, and I really got to know him, and, uh, you know, it, it was a trust thing, and p people get caught up in, in the, the football. It, it was obvious this was a very, very talented team, uh, you know, the one thing I will say, and it's the thing that, that is the most important thing to me in whatever you do, if you're, in, like Troy talked about, whatever you're doing, uh, there were a lot of guys, Jimmy, Dave, these guys, uh, Robert, myself, and a lot of players who felt they had something to prove. And if you feel like you have something to prove and you have a chip on your shoulder, uh, it's amazing what you can do. And, and like. Michael Irvin and, and, and Troy and, uh, you know, I, Mark Stepnoski, Troy was laughing about him. But there, there's guys, that, people talked about that offensive line, said, well, it's a bad offensive line. Well, it was a great offensive line that needed to, you know, have a chance. And, and everyone in that, to me, Jerry, everyone had a chip on their shoulder and had something to prove. And it's amazing what you can accomplish hey, if you have Brad, that. Brad, before you, you got to tell the one story, Jimmy. Our first training camp, you're here. See why I told you to wait, forget about the wait, clock? Do you this see? is the last story, but this is going. Yeah, but the, the Cle Cleveland, we open up with Cleveland. Go so, ahead. So, so this is, you know, I, I was with, uh, like I said, the Rams, and, and a lot of coaches coach <laughs> the, oh, this is a, you know, these guys are so good. We can't beat them, and we can't, you know, everything's, you know, kind of like protecting yourself and you go in the meetings, oh, we can't block this guy. We can't. So getting around Jimmy, it was so refreshing and, and we're in training camp and we've had a good preseason and we're getting ready to go back to, uh, back to Dallas from Austin and we're having a get together and it's in a Mexican restaurant. <laughs> they had the pan going and everything. So Dave and I are talking, and Jimmy comes over, and he says, Wait, what's, what's going on? Oh, we're just talking about we're getting the breakdowns done for Cleveland. We're opening with Cleveland. You know, it's going to be a get, big game. We're on the road. Belichick's our new coach. And he goes, Cleveland? <laughs> he goes, we'll beat the hell out of Cleveland. I want to beat Washington in the second game. <laughs> Coming up, a Hall of Fame moment during the Super Reunion. As we go to break, let's test your knowledge of the Super Bowl 27 season. In 1992, Troy Aikman was the Cowboys' leading passer, Mitt Smith the leading rusher, Michael Irvin the leading receiver. But who led the Cowboys in scoring that season? The answer after the break. Super Reunion trivia in 1992, who led the Cowboys in scoring? Well, it was Lynn Elliott who led the Cowboys in scoring with 119 points, Emmett with second with 114 points. One way the United Way is scoring big points in and around Dallas is with their Healthy Zone program. The initiative is in its sixth year and is helping to change and empower local students by helping them learn to live healthier lives. There is little challenge in convincing kids to play. Six, seven, oh, good job, JD! There is a huge challenge in teaching kids to adopt a healthy lifestyle. That's why the United Way of Dallas has joined the Cooper Institute of Dallas to create the Healthy Zone program. The message to the kids is um, that taking care of yourself through good physical activity, eating well, is a way to build a healthy mind, a healthy body, and a healthy heart. It's all interconnected. Healthy Zone is connecting North Texas. What started with 11 schools in 2011 has expanded to over 140 area schools serving close to 100,000 students around Dallas. It's important to stay active so you have a very good healthy heart and a long life to live. Currently, one in three kids is considered overweight, a stat that has tripled in the last decade. That's part of the reason why Sanger Elementary School in Dallas has decided to join the zone. Overall, the program has really changed the culture of our school. If it wasn't for the school, I would probably, at right now, I would probably be at home playing video games. 
with like weighing 100 pounds, but that's not me today, so the school definitely did change my attitude and mindset. The Healthy Zone program has changed the attitude at the student's home as well. I think it's the confidence for the kids. It's something that um, they can share. It's their thing. It's something they're bringing home to their family. Um, at least that's how mine take it. It's, they're encouraging us to do it. I was sitting around doing nothing and I don't have much to do, why you really go get active and why it's important to me is because when I get older, I don't want to be all where, like, something's holding me back from doing this. Um, and I want my, to be, I guess, healthy, and my heart's healthy, I guess, fit, so I feel better about myself. It changed my mindset to be more active, and um, I wanted to sign up for more clubs so I could become more fit and I could become smarter. And they can carry it for, forward and some of these things, you know, especially with some of uh, the events like I said, triathlon, something they can do forever. It's a sport that, you know, they could take independently and, and do as adults. So. I would say it would be important to be active, to have a long life and a healthy heart. To keep kids in the healthy zone, the United Way's program provides funds and educational tools to schools across Dallas and surrounding cities. If there is a kid and there's a school, we'd like to be there. With Troy Aikman quarterbacking the fundraising campaign for the United Way, the healthy zone hopes to reach championship heights. Troy Aikman is an absolute best choice in the world to be the co-chair of the Healthy Zone Schools. And when you team Troy Aikman with Dr. Ken Cooper, what could be better? That is a winning team. Still ahead, a golden moment you don't want to miss. The Hall of Fame triplets take the stage to pay tribute to the newest member of the Cowboys headed to the Pro Football Hall of Fame. Local artist Vernon Wells was commissioned to create a portrait of Jerry Jones celebrating the Cowboys owner recent election into the Pro Football Hall of Fame. For Wells, taking on the project was a no-brainer. You know, if you get a, a message that Troy Aikman wants you to do something, which, you know, we have a good relationship and all, but when somebody of that stature, Mike Trout, any of those guys, uh, it's, it's an honor to do it. And now for the golden moment for Jerry Jones as Cowboys Hall of Famers take to the stage and surprise the Cowboys owner who will receive his own gold jacket in the Hall of Fame enshrinement ceremony in Canton, Ohio on August 5th. During the 90s, we were known as the triplets. And at the end of our careers, we were all three fortunate enough to be inducted into the Pro Football Hall of Fame. And we are a part of a legacy, the Dallas Cowboys in the Pro Football Hall of Fame. And we're joined tonight by three other Cowboys Hall of Famers, uh, our teammates, our teammate, I should say, Charles Haley, and two other legendary Cowboys who, were, who we measured ourselves against, the teams of the early 80s, late, 90, late 70s, Roger Staubach and Tony Dorsett. There they go. The greats. What's up, buddy? I'm supposed to read this prompter right now. But I just want to say this, y'all know y'all looking up here saying, wow. He never does what he's supposed to do. I'm the most unlikely candidate to be up here, but I am up here. <laughs> I'm the most unlikely candidate. All these good boys. All of them are good boys. Real good boys. I can't, I can't make that claim. <laughs> but I'm up here anyway. <laughs> you know what I mean? And tonight, we share the privilege of honoring another cowboy legend who probably can't make that claim, too, <laughs> who has earned his place among the game's immortal. Would Jerry Jones please step to the stage? The players, coaches, staff, fans, 
and media, at least mo most of the media <laughs> in this room tonight are overjoyed that this August, your accomplishments will be forever immortalized. You have changed the lives of so many of us, and you have changed the game that so many of us love. We thank you for it, buddy. We thank you. You are a pro football Hall of Famer. <laughs> None of those three Lombardi trophies would have been possible without you. And as a small token of our gratitude, we have a gift. Charles, it's a painting commissioned by a local artist, Vernon Wells. Vernon does. That is great right there. <laughs> Let me tell you, buddy. Jerry, the silver and blue are the Cowboys color, but you look pretty damn good in gold. <laughs> Welcome to the Pro Football Hall of Fame, buddy. <laughs> this, this, this is not an accepted speech in any way at all. But I had my coach, Frank Brawls, tell me at Arkansas that, um, Jerry, I've had two genius IQs play for me. You're not one of them. <laughs> but the two that he said played for him did coach the Dallas Cowboys, Jimmy Johnson and Barry Switzer, who's sitting at the table right here. It is funny you are a better athlete. You seem to have more charm. You seem to be better looking when you're around smart people. I can't figure it out. But seriously, uh, to get to be in the room with you, what you should really know is that the NFL, uh, the Dallas Cowboys, their great storied past, when we in this room got a chance to be involved as players and as coaches, with the exception of Roger and Tony, when we got a chance to be involved, there had been a great story written, but who could have ever known that you, you players, you coaches, who could have ever known that you would have basically started writing the story that I may get a little pat on the back for up there at Canton, because that's how it happened. That stadium as beautiful as Texas Stadium was, that stadium doesn't get built without your work, without your effort, and without the success that we're celebrating tonight. Barry, it doesn't happen without you. It really doesn't. It doesn't happen without the people who gave it up to make it happen. And there's never been any type of acknowledgement or recognition that I stand here about that deserves the team concept more than having Jimmy Johnson there, having Dave Weinstead, having Tony Weiss. When I, Gene and I, my, Gene, when we were maybe 10 years before the Dallas Cowboys, uh, Jimmy asked us to come up and be with your coaching staff in Arkansas. You'd taken a break after the season was over and there was there was Tony Wise, and there were some of the coaches that eventually ended up on the staff. And we just went over there and played cards and shot the you-know-what for a couple of days. Just had a big time at that time. There was no doubt when the, the thought about getting involved with the Cowboys and getting involved with the NFL, there was never a doubt in my mind that Jimmy wasn't who I wanted to be with and be a part of it ever. What we had, what we had with you, you players, what we had with you is so beautiful. It's not supposed to almost last for 50 years, but it lasted for four and five years and it changed our lives. It certainly changed mine. 
and I'm proud of every one of you. When I look you in the eyes and saw you tonight, I knew that we were part of something special together. Guys, thank you for the deal. Very much. Thank you. Once the show concluded, the reunion continued with an after party for the team. That's where Jerry Jones and Jimmy Johnson were found in a long one-on-one -on -one discussion. What they were talking about, we can only imagine. But maybe a former two-time Super Bowl winning head coach of the Cowboys will be added to the Ring of Honor sometime soon. Who knows? We hope you enjoyed the Cowboys Super Reunion. Let's hope it's not another 25 years before we celebrate another one.